Good evening. I'm Trevor Morrison. I'm the dean of the law school here at NYU. I want to welcome you all to NYU Law and to thank you for joining us for the 14th annual Emile Noel Lecture. We are thrilled to welcome Minister Josep Borrell to NYU Law. Minister Borrell was the 22nd President of the European Parliament and is currently the Minister of Foreign Affairs, European Union, and Cooperation of Spain. Minister Burrell will be formally introduced in a moment by our colleague, uh, Joseph Weiler, who will be engaging him in a fireside chat this evening. Just a word about the Emile Noel Lecture. It's a series hosted by our Jean Monnet Center for International and Regional Economic Law and Justice here at the Law School. The Jean Monnet Center focuses on the study of international and European economic integration and European Union law through a variety of activities and opportunities uh, to engage the larger academic world and the world of law and policy beyond as well. It promotes an awareness of the current state of the European Union and each year a prominent leader is welcomed here to the law school to present their perspective on the state of the European Union. We are indeed very grateful to have Minister Burrell here with us tonight to give us his thoughts. I will now turn things over to Professor Joseph Weiler who is University Professor, Joseph Strauss Professor of Law, the European Union Jean, Mose, Jean Monnet Chaired Professor and Co-Director of the Jean Monnet Center. He's an eminent scholar, teacher, and colleague here at the Law School. Please join me in welcoming Professor Joseph Weiler and Minister Burrell. Uh, with your permission, I'm going to remain seated. And in uh, the age of uh, Google, we don't need any further introductions. I'm sure you've all Googled Mr. Borrell. Uh, I cannot think of somebody better placed, both in terms of your personal experience, your experience in Spanish politics, your experience in European politics, uh, to talk to us about the State of the Union. And I want to welcome you on my own behalf and on behalf of my co-director, Gronja de Berka, as our annual State of the Union guest this year. And I must say that there's a Yiddish saying that there's nothing that is so bad that cannot be worse. <laughs> and, and I sometimes think of that when I think of the current state of the European Union, because five years ago in the height of the financial crisis, we thought things were pretty bad. But now it seems as if they've taken uh, a more profound, a more troubling turn. And maybe my first question is to cite a, a recent statement by one of the most prominent commissioners of the European Commissioner, Ottinger, who said the European Union is in mortal danger, both from within and from outside. And I would like our conversation to, be, to begin, it's a very dramatic word, mortal danger. Relax, the European Union is not about to die but it's certainly facing very serious challenges. And I think when he was speaking about the danger from within, he even used the term enemies from within, he was talking about the rise of populist euroscepticism, purveyors of so-called illiberal democracy, in my view, a contradiction in terms. Uh, and what even in countries which officially have not become Eurosceptic, but Euroscepticism, anti-Europeanism is not a, the lunatic fringe anymore. It's become mainstream politics, not only in uh, Hungary and Poland, which one tends to mention, but in Austria, in Germany, in Italy, in Sweden, it is mainstream politics. So I would like to invite you to open our conversation with your reflections on this internal challenge which the European Union is facing? Mortal, mortal is a, a big word. I don't think Europe is going to die. But it's true that we have had first the Euro crisis, 2009, it seems to be over, but it has led deep wounds because the crisis has affected deeply the fabric of the European societies. And secondly, recently, from 2015, in the last three years, we had the migration crisis. 
the asylum seekers crisis. Due to the demographic growth in Africa and due to the wars in Syria and Middle East. And this has created an identity crisis. The, the Euro crisis was an economic crisis. We can say it's the economy, stupid, no? Like we said in the 80s. Economic crisis can be solved with uh, money and with institutional arrangements. And we did that. We made a lot of institutional arrangements in order to complete the monetary union. But uh, identity crises are more difficult to solve because they touch the deep roots of the people. And the mindset of the European society, of the European people, is not ready to accept what we call a mass migration. Is there a mass migration in Europe? No. The figures doesn't show a mass migration. Uh, I was talking with the leader of the far-right party in Holland. He was telling me we are at the risk of Muslimization of the country. But there are only 7% of the population in Holland which is Muslim. 7% is not Muslimization. It's a small, a tiny proportion. But people feel like this. People feel the anger, the fear, that a lot of people are coming, they are different, they are taking our jobs. And more important than that, they are changing our identity. And this is the big risk for Europe today. The fact that in the West and in the East, we look at the problem of migration in a different way. Can we say that there is an open view and a closed view, that someone says close borders, fortress Europe, and others say we cannot close borders, we need them, not all of them, but we need a lot of them. And this creates a new difference, which is, uh, as I was saying, much more difficult to solve than the economic problem. Today, in Salzburg, it seems that they haven't reached any kind of agreement about how to deal with migration. And I think this is the, the root of the question, how we Europeans will be able to accept people coming from outside Europe and integrate them. In some countries, we need them and we know we need them. And in other countries, they don't believe they need them and they don't want to accept them. And here, I think, is the most important problem for the unification of Europe. And the only answer I can give to you is that uh, we have to look for a diversification of the process. 27, at the same time, we will not go to a political union. It's impossible. So we have to go to a kind of differentiation on the integration process. In fact, we have done it, because some have the euro, others don't have it. Some have the, the borders, some have Schengen, others don't have it. So you have a lot of differentiation. But I think in order to continue advancing, we will have to, to differentiate more. And this will create two cores. And we'll see that in the next European elections. I think the answer to your question will be given by the citizens when they will go to vote next May. Let's hold on on that a minute, but let me come back to and push back on a couple of things that you said, because it, it's comfortable to think that this is a divide between East and West Europe. Western Europe open and welcoming, and Eastern Europe closed and, uh, if you want, a bit atavistic or uh, xenophobic. But I, I look at the scene in Western Europe. In the last election to the European Parliament, Marine Le Pen was a huge success. And in Italy today, uh, the Eurosceptics are in power. And every public opinion poll say that they are the most popular political force in Italy. And the same is true in Austria. And with very strong uh, 
if you want what you defined as closed attitudes in Sweden, in Holland, so the east-west thing is west maybe a bit uh, too uh, easy. Uh, no, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not so clear. Well, east-west, where is the east and where is the west? No? For example, Prague is more to the west than Vienna. No? But look at Spain and look at Portugal. In Spain, there is not such a thing. On the west-west, Portugal and Spain, we don't have a Le Pen. We don't have a Wilder. But in France, you do. Yes, but on the last elections in France, which were not right or left, which were more open or close, open is one. At the end, open is one. You can tell me, yes, because they were two rounds. Had it been only a, a first round, uh, it was not so clear. Because if you add up the votes from Le Pen and Mélenchon, both from the left and from the right, you add, then there is a majority of people not very much eager about Europe. But at the end in France, and this was the big chance for all of us, Mr. Macron won. Yes, he did quite decisively. So let me ask you another question, still within the same uh, theme. It's true that the migration is the focal point of what you defined of its identity stupid, it's not the economy. But do you have a feeling that the challenge that European citizens feel to their identity is not only focused on migrants, especially Muslim migrants, but there's also a feeling, and we will talk a minute about Brexit, that the European Union itself is a threat to their sense of identity, of being Polish or being Dutch or being Swedish, etc. That it's not just a question of migration. That something in the process of European integration with values which I share, universal values, human rights, etc., a lot of people feel that challenges their uniqueness, their specificity, their self-identity. That's right. Uh, the European Union is a political process by which we want to build a supranational identity without losing our national identity. I always said I am Catalan, I'm Spanish, I'm European. I have the three identities and I, I understand perfectly compatible with each other. Uh, it is not a contradiction for me on feeling European without losing my Spanish or Catalan identity. But maybe it's not true for everybody. Maybe some people feel that Europe means that they are going to lose their own identity. And economics is related with, at the end, economics is there. Huh? When the crisis came, an answer, and Europe was not able to give an answer, Europe was clearly unable to protect people in front of the economic crisis. Then people look for protection to the political entity that they knew the better, the closer. And this was the state. And they go back to the roots. They go back to, to basics. Uh, this Europe, at the end, look, for example, for Spain. For my generation, Europe was a kind of a fair, a good fair. He was giving us money. He was giving resources. He was giving credibility. He was helping us to stabilize our democracy. It was a good thing. It was clear it was a good thing. It was quite easy to be pro-European because it was full of advantages. Now the crisis came and the, the fear become uh, una suegra. How do you say a suegra? <laughs> mother tongue, no? A mother tongue, which by definition are bad. <laughs> and, and instead of giving things and giving resources and supporting us, they start putting disciplines and say, oh, you have to cut the salary, you have to pay more taxes, you have to have less public services because you have to balance your budget. And people start saying, well, this kind of view that is not exactly the same one. No? It, was not on the, it was not on the menu. And this has started creating a kind of anti-European, not in Spain as much as in Italy. But the identity issue is there also. Europe was maybe the open doors to the world and these doors were too much open. 
if I am go getting out of Europe, Brexit, I will have the capacity of controlling the doors. No free movement of people. And this is one of the reasons why the, the, the British voted for leaving the, the Union, because the Union was a threat. Part of the British people understood that the, Brit that the Union was a threat to keep their identity. So let's talk a little bit about Brexit. <coughs> let's not talk whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. I think both you and I and most people here, not everybody, but many people think it was a tragic mistake. But mm -hmm. the British people spoke, and it wasn't a, a razor thin. Uh, the referendum was quite decisive by our normal standards of uh, a referendum. So the challenge beca became how to manage it. And now the weeks are passing. It's March of 2019 where the guillotine falls. And any talk about reversing the decision seems to be fantasy. I don't even know if Europe would want Britain back at this point. Maybe you will comment on that, even if they change their mind. But it seems as if the negotiation to try and make the best of a bad situation have gone astray. And that there's a real risk that there will be an uncontrolled, hard Brexit without a seriously negotiated outcome. How did we get to this point? I hope it's not the case, but there really is a real risk. How did we get to this point? Who is responsible for this state of affairs, which is uncomfortable? Well, Mrs. May said Brexit is Brexit but nobody knew what does it mean exactly Brexit. Brexit is Brexit, but what is Brexit? And I think that today there is a big problem among the British themselves, even among the Conservative Party, which, you know, personally, some are, some are more Brexiters than others. So it's difficult to know exactly which is, or which is going to be the position of the British, the British Parliament when the moment comes to vote a kind of agreement. But in Europe, you know personally that we never get an agreement until the last minute. It would be a miracle that today, one month before the deadline, we would have reached an agreement. It has never happened. And it, things become dramatic, and it seems that there is no solution, and the last night we stop the clock, and finally there is a solution not a perfect solution. And I am sure that the end will reach some kind of agreement because it would be too harmful for both sides not to have one. So I, I, I have a feeling, I share your feeling, that a large part of the problem is that Britain went into Brexit without knowing what it means, without having a strategy, without having a negotiating position, and that somehow Cameron didn't even believe it would happen. It was just solving some internal politics. And then it happened as a surprise. And it's just been astonishing to watch a country like the United Kingdom, like Great Britain, managing its diplomacy in really such an astonishingly unprofessional way. But do you think the European Union shares some responsibility? I have the feeling that a, a big part of what drove the European Union negotiating position, of course, always couched in terms of principle, but was we have to show them, and especially we have to show any other country that might be thinking about Brexit that it's not worth it. And therefore, we have to be very tough, not compromise, in order to send a warning signal to any other black sheep that might emerge. If we are too comfortable with the British, it might be too tempting to other member states. Is there any truth to my polemical statement? Well, maybe at the beginning you could imagine this attitude, but immediately it became clear for everybody that Brexit was a bad business. You don't need to prove it. Everybody understands that it's so difficult to manage a situation like this. It's so harmful that I don't think uh, it's going to be a, any kind of epidemics. 
by the country. Brexit is, by, is going to be a kind of vaccine. Okay? If someone thought that it was a good idea to leave the Union, after watching what is happening in Britain and how difficult it is to disconnect from the European Union, uh, that I, today I don't think there is any country in Europe willing to follow it. But that, that might be in part, just to be, continue my polemic, that the European Union didn't try to make it any easier, just to teach that lesson. I think it wasn't necessary. It was quite clear that it was so difficult that we didn't need to prove it. But on the other hand, to be polemic, we cannot afford to someone who is living a better deal than the ones who remain. That is true. No? <laughs> that we're not going to give a price or a premium. <laughs> Let's connect the story of Brexit to our previous discussion of the internal challenges that Europe are facing. And one of the slogans that most captivated the Brexit camp in the, in the Brexit campaign in the United Kingdom was taking back control. In other words, there was one issue which was migration, in my view, totally artificial in the context of Great Britain. But the other issue was taking back control. And again, my question to you is, I think there's also a sense among many citizens in other European countries that with all the benefits that the European Union may have brought or may be bringing to their countries, there's a certain sense of citizen disempowerment. That citizens don't feel that they have that the institutional arrangements of the European Union notably elections to the European Parliament. And the European Parliament today is a co-legislator with the Council of Ministers, really is an effective mechanism for them to shape the destiny of the European Union, to shape their destiny. And the proof of that is that even though over since 1979, when there were first elections to the direct elections to the European Parliament, the European Parliament gained enormously in power so that today it has some powers that even national parliaments do not have. But it is certainly a veritable co-legislature with the Council of Ministers. In every single election, until the last election in 2014, every election less and less people went to vote. And that's also including the original member states. Uh, there's only one country in the European Union where in the last elections more people voted than in the first election in 1979. In all other member states, it has been a slide. And that shows to me that, that the people were feeling, why do I need to go and vote in European elections if it doesn't really translate into my ability to shape the destiny? So do you think, apart from the question of identity, that Europe has, despite all the changes, still a problem of a democratic deficit, a sense of disempowerment of citizens compared to their sense of empowerment in national politics. Yeah. Yes, that's true. You know, uh, we have transferred sovereignty from national states to supranational institutions which are not clearly identified. Who is responsible for what? And the accountability how does it work? Hmm? And people at the beginning, uh, in a kind of, uh, how can I say, I think there is a word which has been coined, permissive consensus. I let you do. I let you do because it simply works, and I don't have to care about it. And it doesn't touch any vital matter. It's a matter of creating a, a market, closing borders, customs, technicalities. Let them do permissive consensus. A kind of indifference. It works, so I don't have to care. It's a matter of diplomats, it's a matter of foreign uh, affairs ministers. This permissive consensus is finished. First, because it seems that it doesn't work. When the crisis came, it was clear that it was not an answer. It was not a clear answer. We stayed two years asking ourselves, what do we do? How do we answer the Greek crisis? 
And secondly, because now we are talking about deep matters, the deep core of sovereignty. And this permissive consensus is finished. And people don't, don't, dis don't realize very well who is who and who is doing what. You know, every one of us have in mind the Montesquieu scheme. It took 500 years to learn it. But now we understand very well that there is people that vote for a parliament, the parliament votes the government, and then there is a judiciary. And we have this in our, in our mind, in our mindset. But Montesquieu has never been in Brussels. He has never been there to say there is a, a parliament, a judiciary, and an executive. It is a mix, because the commission is a little bit an executive, but it's also a little bit of a legislative and a little bit of judiciary. The parliament has powers, yes, but no taxation power, for example. And the council, the council, what is the council? Go to your students and ask them, do you make the difference between the Council of Europe, the Council of the European Union, and the Council of, uh, of, Minister. of Ministers? These three institutions? Do you really think that the ordinary citizen in the European Union makes the difference between the three of them? No. I know some editors of European newspapers who don't know the difference. <laughs> exactly. So uh, when I talk with my, my fellows, my citizens, uh, my students at the university, or now with ordinary citizens, it's quite difficult to make them un to understand who is doing what in Europe. And it requires a politicization of Europe in order to make people understand how the political game is being played. Politicization means that at the European elections, people have to have in front of them a choice. In Spain, for example, until now, the European elections were national elections because the center right and the center left were quite, quite broad. All of us were Europeans. Europe was good, and, and to be European meant to be in favor of something, something which was not very much clearly defined. With the crisis, the difference came. And with the crisis, to start arguing about economics on, on European terms, at the European level. And we need to make politics at the European level. So to you discuss about European issues, and until now, it has not been the case. So you, do I uh, deduce correctly that you would be among those who favor the Spitzenkandidaten exercise? That when they go to European elections, they also have a sense that they will be electing the president of the commission as a choice between the center right, the center left, the liberals, etc. But mm -hmm. here's the, the, the difficult question. Five years ago, just before the elections to 2014, the, it was the first time they tried this Spitzenkandidaten where the, the main political forces in Europe presented a candidate in elections to the European Parliament with an understanding that the largest party, their candidate, will become the president of the Commission of the European Union. But then I was sitting just like this with Barroso, who was the outgoing president of the Commission, and he said, Yes, I support the Spitzenkandidaten, but once, if it's a Christian Democrat, or if it's a Social Democrat, once they become president of the commission, they have to forget their political affiliation. The commission has to be a non-political body. Now, if I hear you correctly, and I have great sympathy with what you were saying, your idea would be that we need more politicization, that the results of the elections to the European Parliament will not just decide on the person who will be the president of the commission, but of the political direction of the commission. More center left, more center right, more austerity, more growth, real political choices. If we, if we want people to understand politics at the European level, we have to create something that could be translated to their mindset. And for people, it's very difficult to understand that there is a kind of set of people who is a mix, a kind of big coalition government among all ideologies in Europe without a clear direction, without a clear purpose, who
who at the end is a kind of secretary general of the council. At the end, it becomes a secretary general of the council, of the council of the heads of state and government. And if this is the case, the European Union is not a political subject. It's a kind of permanent negotiations by gaining a mountain state. And we go to the intergovernmental path, which is the country of the political union. This can be a, this can be a way out. It's not written, which is going to be the future either. It can be a set of good neighbors who trade among them, who don't fight among them, which is, by the way, uh, something very important, uh, which are ready to do something together in front of the rest of the world, but without having a deeper ambition. This is not the political union. This is a kind of big permanent agreement among governments and this is going to be too weak to face globalization. So if, but if that is the case, and again, I have huge sympathy for this position, it would also mean that there would have to be some changes in how we elect the commissioners. Because of course. if you have a social democrat president of the commission, it is of no use if he has a commission which are a majority of Christian Democrats. So we would have to change a little bit the way we configure the commission if it's really to be political. We have to change the number of commissioners to start with. Meaning reduce them? I think we have to reduce them. At the, on the draft of the Constitution, and it was a member of the Convention, we clearly stated that the number of the commissions should not be the same as the number of member states. Mm -hmm. Because if we really believe that the commissioners doesn't represent their state, why should every state to have their commissioner? Would because Spain be willing to be the first one who says, we will give up our commissioner? <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> From time to time, some member state cannot have a commissioner, not forever. It has to be a kind of rotation. rotation. And remember how things happen. Mm, we, we maintain less commissioners than member states until the Irish voted against it. And said, do you want me to vote yes? Then I want my commissioner. I know my commissioner doesn't represent me, but I want mine. Yes. And then we accept it in order to get out of the stalemate. But I think it was a bad deal because 27 commissioners, at the end, there are not 27 portfolios. I know. And you have to make a big effort of imagination. Agriculture became agriculture, and then it was split to agriculture and fisheries, and then to fisheries and sardines. I mean, <laughs> we just started cutting it very thinly. And not, not only the number of commissioners, but it's mainly the political orientation. The fact that uh, each country nominates its commissioner makes the commission, the commission, not a political body by definition. And this is the, the question. Do we want the commission to become a kind of executive, a kind of government of the European Union? Then we have to create a certain homogeneity of the members of the commission around a project, around a political project. Because if there is no choice between political projects, why should they go to vote? To vote among what? Which is the choice? When I am voting in Spain, I know perfectly that my vote is going to be the presidency of the government to one party, to the other party, and they have some differences that I can understand. When I am going to vote for the European Parliament, I don't really know what I am voting. I am voting a member of the parliament, but behind this member of the parliament, who is going to, to, to run the European Union? And this is the, it, it's called democratic deficit, I, I, I wouldn't call it democratic deficit. I think it's an institutional deficit. Or political deficit. Yes. A, design, a design deficit. It worked very well at the beginning when they were dealing with technical matters. They were six or eight, and it was a basic consensus. With 27, with political matters, and without a basic consensus, it doesn't work. There's also a little technical problem. Imagine 27 people sitting around the table and everyone making an opening statement of one minute. 
already half an hour has gone. <laughs> Just teasing. <coughs> Let's leave a little bit the internal challenge. I go back to our initial Ottinger statement, the mortal danger. Although, as I said, it's not dying so quickly. Uh, what are the challenges from outside? What are the principal external challenges to the European Union? Uh, the, maybe you expect me to say migration, no? No, I think the, the most important challenge for the European Union is the, the weakness of the multilateralism. Or I, I, want, I don't want to say the end of multilateralism. But the fact that today the United States doesn't like the European Union, sure. doesn't like multilateralism, it's clear. And the institutions of the Bretton Woods have been losing ground. And we are multilateral by definition. And we want to work and live in a multilateral world. And this world is weakening this, this, this effect, mainly due to the new attitude of the United States. And this is a big threat for us, because after all, we will be only 5-6% of the world population. We'll be very small. And we have to rely in a world in which there are a kind of an order based on the rule of law and international agreements. And today, some of my colleagues at the Council of Foreign Affairs they start saying that we Europeans, we have to reinvent multilateralism because our big friend, the United States, is no longer there. And we have to tell them that, be or not, we will try to do what has to be done, talking with the Chinese, with the Southeast Asia people, with the Latin American people, with the African people, countries which are emerging, in order to create a world in which multilateralism, the rule of law, and the, a kind of order can be the, the way of doing business, business in the big sense of the world business. No? And for us, the retreat of the United States and the end of this multilateral world is for sure the big step. Are you telling me that your microphone has slipped, maybe? Yeah. The actual yeah. microphone. Is green. Okay. Is working? Yeah. There we go. Ah, I lost the microphone. I was so enthusiastic talking about Europe. I put it here. I was, I, I was defending multilateralism. No? <laughs> <laughs> And I found a Just in case someone didn't hear me, I was saying that the end of multilateralism is a big threat for us because we are the pure essence of multilateralism. So in some strange way, there's a kind of opportunity for Europe here. Because one always accused Europe of saying it was a huge economic power which was unable to translate it into political force on the international scene. And here with this challenge, Europe might its economic might might correspond to its... Well, Henry Kissinger was asked about that by the Foreign Affairs Minister of Germany, and he told him, well, maybe uh, Mr. Trump is going to... Trump plus Brexit, Trump plus Brexit, can be an opportunity for the Europeans to play a new role in the world. Without the British, who has always been a kind of a stop on the way to the political union, maybe we can advance quicker. And with the fact that the American umbrella is no longer there, we have to have our own umbrella um, to build on a strategic capacity by their own and sharing responsibilities in the world order, which means maybe to have more defense capacities by their own and to tell the states that, well, if you leave, we remain, and if you do something that we don't like, we will tell you. The Iran deal, for example, no? the, the, the broken of the Iran deal, or the climate change deal, is very damaging for Europe, very much damaging, from the point of view of security, and from the point of view of economic interest. 
So maybe you have to tell our American friends that, uh, well, we, we are not going to accept this easily, and we'll do whatever we can do in order to protect our economic interests, our firms, and to keep alive this Iran deal that for us, it was a very important matter because it was a key issue for our immediate security. And I am not talking about economic interest, but just security on the crude meaning of the word. And I think that the Germans are taking the lead on that. The German minister has said the other day that we should abandon the unanimity rule on external policy. This is a very important step. If we were able to abandon the unanimous rule on external policy, we could start being an external power. And would Spain support that? Yes, we are the most pro-European government in Europe today, uh, for sure. The, the new Spanish government has put the, the European project at the core of its political project, and we are very much in favor of everything that makes the integration of Europe going further. Just to, uh, a little footnote to uh, one of the things you said. Uh, I thought it was a, a really powerful and original answer when I asked the minister what is the most important uh, external threat or external challenge. And he could have easily said Russia or Turkey or Iran or whatever, and he said the breakdown of multilateralism. That's a profound answer, and I think it, uh, it's not the usual answer that uh, politicians will give. But is there a security threat to Europe in the old conventional sense? Yes, it is. The, the Europeans had been fighting so much against each other. The last world war was awful, that we got war out of a rather screen, no? war is something that we cannot imagine, among us and in our borders. And we were so much convinced that peace was the, the natural state of the world, that suddenly when the war appeared in our borders, we were a little bit surprised. But this is true, the war is something that happens. And Russia start a war in our borders. And Yugoslavia, fall apart in a very damaging war. And Syria is there. And the Middle East is not in peace. And the north of Africa, who was a stable, has become a source of instability and danger. And this is shocking for us. And suddenly we realize that and the, the fact that maybe something called war can approach to our borders and our houses and our villages has produced a kind of a reaction that in the case of Germany, for example, means that they are ready to spend more in defense. And they are ready to mobilize their troops out of their geographic limits. By the way, let me tell you that Spain is the European country that has the, the biggest number of troops mobilized on European defense missions. We are the most proactive mem member state on the capacity, development of troops, deployment of troops, on all the scenarios of risk, from Niger to Somalia to Lithuania to Yugoslavia. And people will have to understand that we have to be ready to face risk that we believe they had gone forever. So here is one of the <coughs> challenges to Europe, because if we take the combined spending on defense of the 28 member states of the European Union today, or the 27 next year, it's greater than the defense spending of Russia. And yet, the way it's realized in the field in terms of an effective defense forces it just doesn't correspond to that. And it's just a problem of coordination, determination, a decision. Would you go back on that initial rejection of the European defense community? to really have a high degree of integration so that the money which is already spent can actually show itself in terms of effective security capacities? Well, France has presented a, a new initiative on this direction. No? We have much more soldiers than you, the state. The European armies all together have more men and women on the uniform than the uh, US army. 
but we cannot, uh, we cannot make the same role. No? At the end, we don't have the strategic capacities. We don't have all the warfare of the modern warfare. No? And we have a lot of different kinds of planes, uh, weapons. And for every generation of weapons, we have 12 different classes. No? You have three different classes. It means that the cost, the average cost, is much less, and the efficacy is bigger. Uh, we have to learn that uh, we have to communitarize, commu communitarize. communitarize the armies. And you know, a state is a territory, a currency, a border, and a defense capacity. We have put together the territory, no borders, the currency, the euro, but the army, the army is the last resort of sovereignty. No? The sovereign at the end relies on its army. And to not to have its own army, but pulling together the armies, makes still a little bit of, uh, you know, people are not so much sure that it can be a good idea. Remember that the first step on building the European Union was through the army. And it was rejected by the French parliament. Yes. They voted against it. Why? Well, because the wounded of the war were too fresh. And because the communists didn't want to build an European army to face the Soviet Union. But the Soviet Union is no longer there. And the wounded of the war has, I hope, been healed. And now it's much more clear for European people that putting together our defense capacities would be much better from economic and even political point of view. And if you go to Eurobarometer and you ask to the European people, what do you think the European Union should do? And you give a list, one of the most voted things is defense. People yeah, want an They all have defense. armies, but none of them can effectively defend the patria. Whereas together, it would be a much more effective defense force. And we are doing that little by little. Look, our planes, the Spanish planes are in Lithuania together with the German planes. No? Uh, they are together. No? To be together is something different than uh, acting together. But step by step, the idea of creating a strategic capacity, yeah, yeah, I'm saying that like this, it sounds better. I'm saying a strategic capacity, it looks better. No? Building a strategic capacity, it will be something needed due to the retreat of the Americans. But do you know what's happening? People in the East are not so much convinced that we are able to create a defense capacity because they know what happened in the past. They know what happened in Poland during the World War, what happened in Czechoslovakia, during, what happened in Hungary, when the, the, the hard time comes, who is coming? Uh, one president of a republic of the East, I will not say which one because then they have problems, uh, told me, you know, if I have a trouble, do you think the young people from Madrid will come to help me? Or if someone is coming, they will be the American Marines? And now he thinks, and if the American Marine doesn't come, what they have to do? Do I have to create a defense capacity, or I have to become as close as I can to the American defense capacities, because I cannot rely on the European ones? This is the existential issue that we are debating now. Are we, are we capable, are we able to create our own capacity without divorcing from NATO? It's not a matter of substituting one thing by other, but creating our own capacities in order to, and, oh, and on that, America, uh, America is right, in order to share the burden of defense in a more fair way. Well, maybe you will still say thank you to Mr. Trump. <laughs> well, uh, I understand. <laughs> Let me take this, and I certainly don't want to get you into trouble on this topic, but would you be willing to speak just a little bit and with all the delicacy that which we appreciate about relationship between Europe and the United States? Well, I, we, uh, I could use the same delicacy that Mr. Trump is using with us. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, get out your phone and start tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, in some things, Mr. Trump, not Mr. Trump, Mr. Obama, because the agreement on defense, on the expenditure on defense, was adopted in Wales during the Obama president presidency. So it's nothing new. The fact that the burden has to be shared in a fair way, it was President Obama who put that on the table. So it's nothing new. And I, I, we have to understand that uh, things have changed, and the Americans have another front line. The front line is no longer in Europe. <coughs> the front line is in the Pacific and they have uh, another interest to take care of. No? Uh, we cannot blame for that. No? But uh, when, when Mr. Trump has said once that Europe is a fool, we are not a fool. We are friends. But uh, the problem is that we are putting together defense capacity and trade. We are putting together the cost of the militaries and the balance of payments. This has never passed in the, in the past. In the past, I wasn't telling you, well, I am spending money on your defense because you are a good client. You are no longer a good client, why should I defend you? Putting together the cooperation among countries and the competitivity among firms is something new in the transatlantic relations. So what is your comment on, because it really isn't just that the perception in Europe, and I think it's true, is that the Pax Americana is over, or at least one cannot rely on it the way one relied on it for the last 60 years or 70 years. But there's also a feeling that America is dismantling uh, the international trading system, that it's asphyxiating the WTO, that... Uh, even the regional agreements, they are working against. Uh, how does Europe relate to that? Well, it doesn't make, uh, sorry. We are, as I told you, we are, not, we are not very happy. And in some deals which are not, uh, nobody talks about climate. After Paris Agreement, we have stopped talking about climate. But this is a very important threat for all of us. And we regret a lot that the Americans withdraw from the Paris Agreement, as much as the nuclear deal with Iran. We are not talking about that, but it's very important. It's not just a matter of trade or business. It's a matter of understanding which is the global answer to the global threats. Migration, for example, it's clear that we have a, a misunderstanding or different approach about migration. No? Well, among us also, no? among the Europeans also, we have a different approaches. But the, 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 the role of the, of the United States with respect to the regional agreements has completely changed, and we have to be aware of that and act consequently. Last little topic, or big topic, but we don't have much time before we get to Spain itself. Uh, you the foreign minister of Spain, and it's not just the foreign minister of Spain because you have a role in the shaping of European foreign policy. What to you are the most challenges, the biggest challenges in the world today? And not specifically in a European uh, challenge to Europe, but the foreign policy challenges to the world. The Middle East, China, Russia, Turkey, there's a long list. Where would you put your number one, number two, number three challenges in that respect to the world order, apart from the multilateralism which you already to discussed. To the world order or to, to the Europeans? I now want in a, in a more global sense. Well, it's going to be a big uh, challenge among China and the state, no? the two big players of the future. And the important thing is which is our, which is our role on this big game. No? The big game of the future is the states versus China, or China versus the state. Which is the place for the Europeans in this big game? In the middle, there is Africa. The Chinese are disembarcando, debarking, debarking, landing in Africa. 
uh, they are landing in Africa with a lot of money and without conditionalities. And we Europeans, we put a lot of conditionalities and we don't have a lot of money. So the, the approaches have to be completely different. No? Africa is going to be, a, for us, I wouldn't say a threat, but something that we cannot avoid looking at in a much more uh, powerful way. Look, uh, Africa has tripled its population in the last 30 years. And it's going to double it in the next 20. It means it has multiplied by six its population. In 20 years from now, it will be 1,000 million more of young Africans. Not 1,000 million of young Africans, 1,000 million more in 20 years. Africa will be the most populated part of the world. And the, my, the demographic pressure is going to be so important for us that it will change all geostrategic relationships. So which, play to, which role to play in the big game between China and the States? And which role to play with respect to Africa? These are the two most important threats for us. Then Russia. I, I don't think this is, going, this, is, this, is, this is going to be a big problem. It's not an existential problem. It's a matter of, uh, well, dealing with. Russia, it's, it has the, the gross national product of Italy. It's, a, it's an economy of the size of Italy. Russia is spending in defense 60 billion euros. The NATO is spending 15 times more. So it's, what are we talking about? I think the most important thing for us is Africa and the duopole China state. Does uh, Europe have a role in the Middle East? In practical terms, no. Should it? <laughs> it should. <laughs> it should. If you say by Middle East, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Mm -hmm. For example? Well, it's the biggest of the example. Uh, in practical terms, we have to recognize that we are playing the democracy, the diplomacy of the Czech. We pay for. We support economically the Palestinian authorities and we rebuild what the war destroyed once and again. But uh, it's clear that to play a role in the Middle East, you have to be ready to be a hard power. If you only have uh, soft power, well, I don't think Mr. Netanyahu is going to listen to you. No, he's not. Uh, <laughs> let's come to Spain. And what has captured uh, public attention, public opinion, public interest is the internal dilemma of Catalonia. And the way I want to introduce the topic is to become a little bit personal because you are Catalan. And before you explain to us how you see the, both the conflict and uh, the future of that conflict, uh, I don't want to say between Catalonia and Spain, I want to say between uh, Spanish Catalans and other Spanish people, but just tell us what was it to you to grow up as a Catalan? What does your Catalan identity mean to you personally? And from that we will go into the actual uh, challenge that the independence movement in Catalonia is posing in Spain. Yes, uh, you know, I, I feel like, you know, these Russian puppets, you know, they are one inside the other. Matrushka. Matrushka, you know, they are one inside, this is a small one and then a bigger one. Well, I feel like this. I have three puppets. I, I, I am Catalan, I am feel very much Catalan. I was born in a small village in the Pyrenees, very small village, in a difficult time, the post-war. And I remember very well when I, when I was going to school, I, I learned Catalan at home. I never been able to speak Spanish with my fathers, never. It was so artificial. I always speak Catalan with them. Even when, when some friends of Madrid came to my house, 
I had to tell them, sorry, I cannot speak Spanish with my father because it sounds, sounds, sounds so strange to my ear. So I learned Catalan at home, and then I went to the school, and at the school I learned Spanish. And it's very important, very useful <laughs> to, to be able to speak Spanish. And I'm very happy of having had this opportunity. But I have to tell you, I remember that in my school it was a big picture of General Franco pointing to me. Well, I didn't know who was this guy. But he was, he was a, have a, pointing to me, and it was written, don't speak Catalan. Literally, don't speak Don't speak Catalan. Don't speak Catalan. You have to speak the language of the empire. You have to speak the language of the empire. And I was a little boy with empire. What does it mean, an empire? We have no heating at home. We don't need a lot. What kind of empire is this one? But what I remember very well is that it was forbidden for me to speak Catalan at school. And this has marked a generation. And for some of this generation, it has created a kind of resentment against this fact. The fact that Franco's regime tried to kill the Catalan identity, at least at the beginning. Then, little by little, things become smoother. But the, the confusion between Franco's regime and Spain has created in some Catalans the feeling that this state is my enemy, not my state. And I'm always saying that, look, Spain is one thing, and Franco regime is another thing. So, so that's what is so difficult to understand from outside. So Franco dies. The new Spanish constitution, which this year is celebrating 40, 40 years, years, is adopted. Nobody claims that it was not adopted democratically, including the Catalan voice in the adoption of that constitution. It speaks clearly on the indivisibility of the Spanish kingdom, while, of course, recognizing this or that. So what explains, in your view, the emergence of such a forceful, uh, powerful independence within Catalonia? Where does it come from? Because well, it, it seems that with the death of Franco and the new constitution... It has always been in Catalonia, let's say, uh, 20, 25 percent of the citizens who feel Catalan and doesn't feel Spanish. I have uh, many of them among my closest circles, among my family and among my friends. Their identity is Catalan and no more. It has been 20, 25, depending. But then it came the economic crisis. It came this sad story of the uh, statute, statuto. Explain this to us in two minutes, the sad story of the statuto. Well, uh, statuto, which is a kind of Catalan constitution who was agreed first in the Catalan parliament and then amended in the Spanish parliament, we make the big mistake of uh, making the Catalan people to vote before passing the test of constitutionality. First they voted, they approved it, and then we sent it to the Constitutional Court to check the constitutionality of the text. And the Constitutional Court said that some of the articles were not constitutional, and they changed it. Well, if you vote for something and then they told you that it was not good, and you buy a car, before buying the car, you want to be sure the car is running. Huh? You don't go to the, to the, to the checking, the mechanical checking after buying the car, you go first. And this, this has created a resentment. The economic crisis has... Because the Constitutional Court cut out certain aspects of certain, the Statute of Autonomy. Certain people say that the whole statute was abolished. No, that's not true. Some articles, but yeah, not many, but some. At a symbolic level, one of the things the, the Constitutional Court was opposed to was the notion that there is a Catalan nation. And yet I find, while I totally reject uh, Catalonian independence, uh, both in my writing and my speeches, etc., 
I find the notion of a nation of nations a very progressive notion, a lesson that Spain can give to the world, that here you can have a state which is a nation of nations. Uh -huh. Why was that so neuralgic? Why did no, one turn against it? The constitutional court didn't say that, said, well, <laughs> Catalonia can be considered a nation, but it doesn't have, let's say, a political consequences on the meaning that being a nation, it has to have a state. For sure. That's all. But if you go to the Statute of Autonomy of Andalusia, which is fully Spanish, no? it says that Andalusia is the realidad nacional, a national reality. And then we start doing semiotics here. No? Because which is the difference between a nation and a realidad nacional, what we are talking about. No? And the idea of a nation of nations is something that part of the left, me included, is defending on the way that you can have a, a, a political nation which is composed of nations which are nations on the social, cultural, or linguistic aspect. And I, I think, and I said the other day, and it was in the middle of a kind of a, a debate about is Catalonia is a nation? Well, what do you mean by a nation, first of all? No? And if you understand, as I understand, that uh, a nation is a set of people sharing a certain amount of socio-cultural characteristics, a language is a very important one, but not the only one, you can consider that a nation being part of the whole Spanish nation. But this is something difficult to understand for people who say, nation is like the mother, you only have one. No? You cannot have several mothers. And others who say, no, 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 no. Nation means the pre-step to becoming a state. I don't talk about nation on the socio-cultural linguistic dimension, but on the political dimension. Well, this is another completely different thing. And some people will never accept the idea of several nations inside a whole nation. And others will say, that will not accept any other consideration of nation than the political one. And here is the debate. So Among where us. do we stand now with this conflict? It seems a bit of an impasse. We are better today than three months ago. Yes, we are better. Explain to us. Well, we have changed the government. <laughs> <laughs> we have changed the government and we have started uh, a new approach with more dialogue, with more, the, the, the relations were broken, it was not way of communicating. I think we made a lot of mistakes on dealing with the independence movement. The 1st of October was a disgrace for all of us because it was clear that the image of Spain was suffering a lot. Considerably. Uh, and well, the that, that to explain, that's when uh, the independence movement in Catalonia against what was perceived against uh, Spanish law, Spanish constitution, deci decisions of Spanish courts, nonetheless went ahead and held a referendum and uh, the government tried to prevent uh, physically Physical. the referen referendum from being held. Uh, and you know how it is. It's enough for one person to have a bloody face and that gets broadcast around the whole world. It was hmm. not a great moment, a glorious moment for the Spanish image, no. independent of the reality. No, and it's difficult to, to explain. Is the, you cannot fight uh, with the images of someone who wants to vote and a policeman comes and try to prevent it because uh, you cannot argue against, against that. No? In the modern communication in which we live, you cannot fight with arguments with respect to these images that can be widely broadcast and showing that Spain is a representative. It's, it's a, Franco is still alive. No? Franco is dead, happily for us. Uh, and Spain is a full democracy. It, we rank among the 20 full democracies in the world. It's not me who is saying that. It's the, intelligent unit of the economies is the World Bank. All the rankings in the world 
ranks Spain among the first 20 countries, well above Belgium, for example, who gives lessons to us with, a, with an independency judiciary, with a state of rule of law. We are not perfect, but we are not a repressive regime with political prisoners. No, no happily for us, but the crisis was deep and badly managed. And now we are in a trying of a, a dialogue in order to rebuild bridges and try to see if we can, by the first step, to slow down emotions, to, to calm emotions. No? And secondly, to see if there is a, a, because when you say Catalonia and the Catalans, don't remember that only 47%, the maximum 47%, have been voting in favor of independence on the ordinary elections. 47% is not enough to declare independence unilaterally. And now even independent people accept that. Now even part of them say, well, with 47% of the people, we are not enough in order to declare independence uni unilaterally, without agreement. Well, that's, that's good. That's a first step. At least you understood that, that with 47%, you cannot do that, even if you have majority in the chamber. Because the electoral law gives a premium to the parts of the country where independent people are Majoritarians. We yeah. know that game from this country too. Exactly. <laughs> but in this country, Nevada doesn't declare independent. No? Or Alaska. No? This kind of things doesn't happen here. Texas might, but. <laughs> Texas asked for it, and it was said it's not in the Constitution. Look, in Italy, the Veneto required a referendum for independence. And the Constitutional Court said, no way. In Germany, some people in Baviera ask for the same thing, and the Constitutional Court said, no way. There is only one case in the world in which the government accepted a referendum. It's called it. Canada, no. The Canada government never accepted the referendum. It was unilateral. There is only one case done by Cameron, which will not be in the British history considered as the best prime minister in the world, no? Because he played pocket. He played with the country twice. First with Scotland and second with the European Union. But even, even in, the, in Britain, when people say the Scotland have the right, no, they don't have the right. They don't have the right because now they want to repeat the referendum and they go to London to ask permission to Mrs. May, and Mrs. May says no. So you have to ask permission for doing something. It means that you don't have the right. Because if I had the right, I don't have to ask permission. So Mr. Cameron said, yes, I allow you to do it. And Mrs. May says, I don't allow you to do it. So the right to secession is not recognized in the world unless you are a colony, you are under military occupation, or the human rights are systematically violated. Some one of you believe that Catalonia is a colony that is military occupied, or the human rights are systematically violated? Well, I don't think nobody believes that. So another thing is that we have a political problem. OK, let's try to solve it. But with 47% of the votes, with 47% of the people, you cannot declare independence. It doesn't work. It doesn't fly. Nobody will recognize you. The European Union will not recognize you. I told them many times, this is a jump in the vacuum. There is nothing. No government in the world will recognize a unilateral independence voted by 47% of the people. And the European Union will close the door. And they didn't believe it. And unhappily for all of us, unhappily for all of us, we have gone to an emotional breakdown. There are people in jail. They will be judged. 
the society is divided, people are confronted, and let's pray God that things doesn't become worse. And the only way of preventing from things becoming worse is to try to talk, is to try to dialogue, is to try to look what things can be done in order to find a way out which can be agreed. But if the only proposal from the independency is we want independency, well, then I'm sorry. This will not be accepted by any Spanish government. That's clear. I have, I have a question to you because I think Spanish diplomacy has been very successful. Because as you point out, not a single state in Europe, not the institution. In the world not the institutions of the European Union, and no other state has uh, been hospitable to the Catalonia independence. So Spanish diplomacy has done what it uh, has to do. But in public opinion, if you read the newspapers, if you, if you read the, the blog sphere, the social networks, etc., uh, that voice, the kind of statements that you made today have been very absent. And, uh, That's why I'm here. Pardon? That's why I'm here. <laughs> but th there has, it looks as if Spanish governments have not appreciated the importance of public opinion beyond diplomacy and making sure that no state breaks line. Do you, do you agree with that assessment? I, I agree completely. Oh, now it works. <laughs> I, agree, I agree completely. I couldn't agree more. Our diplomats made a very good job on their job on their professional job, dealing with the governments. It was not so difficult because at the end, all governments in the world understood what was happening. And no government in Europe will, is, was going to, to support changing the borders unilaterally because they know what does it mean. But from the point of view of what we can call the public diplomacy, the, 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 the people who create opinion, I don't know it's public opinion of the published opinion. It's a difference. No, I, but I understand what do you mean. Most of the published opinion were having a view of the problem which were very much following a certain relato. How do you say relato? Story, narrative. 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 No, the Catalan independence has been able to build a narrative story, something is, to is tell. There, is there anything going back to the substance of the problem? So I understand the policy, your policy and the policy of your government is to be more dialogical, to try and calm the emotional heat that the referendum last year created, etc. But is in substance, are there any proposals on the table or in the back room of what could be given in terms of maybe more autonomy, et cetera, that would be short of independence? Is it, or is it just a process of? More autonomy? Well, the, the, the president of the government has offered it to write a new statute. We have to vote, yes, we have to vote again. But what to vote? a new relationship between Catalonia and Spain, which is the statute. But in order to build or to write a new statute, we have to build an agreement among Catalans. And believe me, the problem is not between Catalonia and Spain, as if it were two uniform identities. The problem is among Catalans. When you have 47% of the people voting independency, 6-7% which you don't know exactly what they are voting, and 40% voting against, you have a split society, a complete split society. The first thing that you have to do is to try to make an agreement among them, because if not, with whom I am going to deal? This is a problem among us, among Catalans themselves. And in this, in this sociological scenario, one part has been very active, very active, working a lot, defending their points of view, having a television which was very helpful, and the other part was silent, until a certain moment. 
And at that moment, this part of the society also is there and wants to be listened, wants to be taken into account. And if we want both parts be part of a whole and single people, uh, when Mr. Torres said, we are, we are a single people, some un sol poble. Who is part of these people? I am part of the single people. I am part of the single people that Mr. Torres is calling off. Yes, I am. But I am accepted? Or is only talking about the people who are in favor of independence? And the others? We have to rebuild the single people of Catalonia because after the, the transition, it was a reality. We were a single people. It was not a big divide. And now this divide has to be canceled. And are you optimistic? It will take a long. It will take very long. If we are successful, it can take 20 years. I'll pray for you. <laughs> I'm afraid we have, we're getting ready to the end. We started a little bit late. And it, typically, we end these conversations with a few personal likes. Personal likes? Yes. Oh my god. Number one, who's your favorite author? If you were on a desert island, what would be the two or three books that you would want to have with you? Uh, I will bring with me, for sure, Isabel Allende. Nice. And Garcia Marquez. Nice. So far, no Spanish author. <laughs> And just to look uh, intelligent, I will bring the memories of Montesquieu. <laughs> Very nice. And your favorite music, what would you like to listen to on the desert island? Serrat uh, singing Machado's poems. Very nice. I don't know if you know that. Huh? Mm. Some do. Some do. You should make them listening one day Serrat singing the poems of Antonio Machado. I'm afraid this is America. We can't make anybody do anything. <laughs> be a little bit directive. Come on. I'll be out of a job in two minutes. <laughs> and uh, your favorite movies, if you had a DVD on the desert island? Movies. Or some connection to Netflix. They are everywhere. <laughs> Can I tell you one thing? I never had TV at home. Never. I still don't have. Uh, and it, I haven't seen any one of these series that it seems that you can buy in Netflix or somewhere. But uh, for sure, there are uh, films that mark me. French films. French films. Un coeur en hiver. You know it? You know these French films that are film theater, no? they are talking. Not this American film with a lot of movement and everybody killing everybody, no, no. <laughs> no, no, the, the films in which you are sitting and talking and thinking, slowing, talking about love, life. There are actually thing. two types of American movies. <laughs> Either everybody killing everybody or dysfunctional families. But <laughs> <laughs> last thing, when you came back, and with this we will end, Minister, when you came back from the desert island where you had to eat all the time bananas, what would be the meal that you would be thinking of? Hombre. <laughs> Pam tumaca. <laughs> Pam tumaca is the, the best contribution of the, Sp of the Catalans to the world gastronomy. You take a slice of bread, you put on the fire a little bit, then you put a tomato, you grasp the tomato, you put oil, a little bit of pepper, and that's fantastic. That's called in Italian fetunta. Same, <laughs> but it's much better to call it pam tomac. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before we thank the minister, there will be a very light refre refreshments offered if you e exit Go to your right and turn to your right for those who want to stay and chat a little bit. You're all welcome. I think on behalf of everybody, I'd like to thank uh, Minister Borrell for a truly fascinating, stimulating evening. Thank you, sir.